this class is towards spiritual maturity. Um, and so I invite you to, uh, if you haven't already, there are books out in the auditorium, on the, or in the auditorium, in the vestibule out on the, on the table on the right. Um, and I promise that as we go through the class, we will try to answer the questions in the book. So I'll, say, I'll have more to say about that in a second, but to start us off, I'm gonna ask Wayne Bowen if he would lead us in an opening prayer. Amen. So let me say something about the book that y'all have. Um, my editing skills were not great on this book. <laughs> and what that means is that you might look at this book as you're preparing during the week, and you might see a question, and you might go, what was he thinking? And I assure you that about the same time you're looking at that, I'm looking at that same question at home going, what was I thinking? <laughs> so that's okay. And so if you see something that you don't understand in the book, that's fine. And if we get into here and you don't understand it, just say, hey, what, what's going on with this question? I don't understand. So just kind of laying that out there up front. But I think together we will be able to, uh, to piece together what was going on with these lessons. And, and hopefully that we will be able to put together uh, some understanding of what uh, what the Lord expects from us in terms of achieving spiritual maturity. And that's really what, what the whole point of this is. So if I've accomplished that by the end of the quarter that we have a little better understanding that I feel like I've got my job done. Um, as we start thinking about this, um, I'll talk about think and do in a minute, but, but I just wanna ask the question, what is spiritual maturity? I beg your pardon? Growing in the knowledge of Christ and living. Growing in the knowledge of Christ and living it. That is a great definition. Anybody else got, got something they want to toss in with that? Okay. Look, I like that. I think that's a great way to start. If we want to think about this, think about a, a question here. Who was mature in the Bible? Who was spiritually mature in the Bible? And how do we know? Anybody got thoughts about who was spiritually mature? Andy? Sure, I would hope. Okay. Okay, that's a great example. Paul was mature because he was able to handle the things that, were, that came at him. Who else was mature? Moses was mature. And how do we know that? Okay, because he, he always just kind of took what the Lord said and ran with it, right? Okay. Any other thoughts? Anybody else that you can think of? Those are two really good examples. Anybody else? Job? Yeah, Job was spiritually mature, right? Job, a lot more mature than, than the people around him, it would seem, right? Uh, his, his wife didn't have the same level of maturity that Job did. Uh, she was all about just curse God and die. Sir? Uh, Noah. Noah. Great, great topic. And why, why would you say that? Uh, there you go. One of eight. Uh, 
Yeah, yeah. Since I have to do a lesson on this in a couple of weeks, I, I'm, I'm taking notes. So anything else you got, just ro just roll with that. But uh, yeah, Noah was Noah was mature. Joshua. Joshua. Why was he? How do we know he was mature? Okay. Yeah, really good. Okay. So I think those are some really good examples, and, and there's more, right? We could, I mean, as we kind of get the conversation going, we could go through 50 Bible characters that we would probably classify as mature. But I want to kind of go back to the, the definition of maturity. If you think about who was mature in the Bible, and you talk about the examples that we had, one of the things you see is that when we connect thought, faith, and action to the glory of God, that's maturity, right? None of the people that we talked about was mature because they just knew a whole lot about the scripture. No, none of the people we talked about were mature because they just thought about God all the time and they didn't do anything. They all took action, but action that was informed by direction of the Lord. And so when we talk about think and do, which is we're going to see a lot of this quarter in, in the courses that I put together, in the lessons I put together, we're going to talk about that connection between thought and action. Because those are the things that together let us know that we are advancing in maturity. So let's take a look at Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 16. We're going to use one of the examples that we had, which was Paul. Philippians 3, 12 through 16. Somebody would be willing to read that for me. Andy. Andy, I think you're in the wrong chapter, my friend. 3, 12, yeah. It was a great, it was a great verse, but... You're helping me out, but yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, so Paul in Philippians 3 talks about maturity. He talks about, and, and it's interesting that even though he talks about as many of us as are mature, he says, I'm not there yet. You know, I haven't fully attained. I haven't fully gotten to where I need to be. And, and I think we'll find that that's a mark of maturity, is understanding with humility that, you know what, I'm never going to get there. I got a long, I'm always going to have a long way to go. I'm always going to have more and more and more that I can do. But according to Paul in this verse, what is mature? What is the mature thing to do? Press forward, right? Somebody have a thought here? Okay, pressing on towards the goal. And the other thing that he talks about in here, not only moving that, but have the same mind, right? And, and, you know, and we're going to see Paul make this reference in several places where he says, you know, not just on your own, but look at examples around you. Look at me, for example, and he said, let us be of the same mind, right? Let's get our mind right, and let's press forward with action toward the goal, now, in your notes, I know I talk about James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, but we all know this. Faith without works is what? Faith without works is dead. And that whole area of Scripture talks about, you know what? If your brother is naked and hungry and you say, depart in peace, be warmed and filled, that's really not going to get it done, right? 
your heart might be in the right place, but if it doesn't translate into action, your faith is not meaningful. Your faith is not mature. You haven't quite grasped that connection between action and, and your mind, thinking and doing. So in Romans chapter, eight, chapter 10, rather, verses 8 through 17, can I get somebody to read Romans 10, 8 through 10? We don't need to read all of the section there. I think that just gives you the whole thought. But Romans, Romans 10, 8 through 10. Ten, eight through ten. Okay, thank you for reading that. So what is the connection there? What, what does my heart tell me to do? Conviction and action, right? I need to believe in my heart, and then I need to act. I need to confess with my mouth that Jesus is Lord. You know, I need to take the heart and action together. So if you compare that to, to Matthew 15, 18 through 20, and he talks about, you know, the things that come out of your mouth tell you what's in the heart, right? He says envyings and murders and all these things. They, they start in the heart. And he says not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth because it reflects the heart. What's the disconnect that Jesus is talking about between heart and action? Right. The heart caused the action, right? Even for hypocrites, right? You know, it, it's still telling about your heart because I can come here and I can teach Bible class and I can look really nice on Sunday morning and I can look real pious in the pew. But on Monday morning, if I'm telling dirty jokes at work, I'm a hypocrite, right? Because my heart's not right and, and my mouth is going to show what's really in my heart. I can't keep up hypocrisy indefinitely, right? At some point, it's got to slip out, right? Because it, can tr it drives where we're going. And really, that's what he's talking about here. Not being a hypocrite. Letting your mind and your actions work together towards that. Yes, sir? You cannot be a Christian on the day of the week. That's right, you can't. You have to be all in, as we talked about last year, right? Yeah, you, you, can't, you can't let your words not be reflective of your heart. That's not, now, there are, you know, there are stages of this, right? So you take somebody who has not been raised in the church, and you convert them to Christ, they're probably not going to have that whole mind and action thing totally worked out in the early going, right? I mean, they're still maybe going to think, well, okay, I'm, I'm with the Lord, I'm going to show up Sundays, Right? What's going on during the rest of the week, that's kind of my business. But as they mature, as they grow, they start to understand that that's a disconnect. That I cannot, you know, continue the old way of life and then say, I am yours, Lord, on Sunday morning. So it, it is a growth thing, you know. Somebody does not come out of the waters of baptism and is totally mature. It is a growth process. And so while we can help them with that, I think that's why the scripture tells us that when we talk to brethren, particularly younger brethren, we got to have some understanding and some love and some compassion for them because they may not have totally put it all together yet. So we got to work with them in a sense of maturity. Okay? Thoughts about that? Oh. Yeah. And, and we understand that more and more, uh, you know, as, as, as we not only grow ourselves, but we also look at our lives and see the mistakes that we make, right? And, and what we have to do. Okay. So in 1 Peter 1, 13 through 60, 16, Peter, said, Peter is quoting the Old Testament, and he says, Be holy, and he's talking about God, be holy for I am holy. In what parts of our lives do we have to be holy? 
all the parts of our lives, every bit of it, right? So when, when Peter says, be holy, and, and when he quotes the Lord, the Lord's not saying just do right. He's saying think right. Right? It's not, it's not an either-or proposition. All right? So then, Paul talks about in Ephesians, this notion that, that we've kind of touched on here. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 11. And can I get someone to read Ephesians 4, 11 through 16? Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. Wayne? See how many times in that reference of Scripture Paul talks about growing, developing, building, right? He talks about, you know, this is how the Lord set things up, and he says, you know, for the edifying of the body of Christ, right? Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge, to a complete man, to the measure of the stature, that we no longer be children, right? that we should not be children any longer as we grow and develop in Christ. Now the question is, physically, what do children need to grow so that eventually they are no longer children? Milk. Nourishment, what? Milk. milk, okay. Nourishment, milk, what else do they need? Exercise, Exercise right? If you just sit there and eat all the time and don't do anything, you will get bigger. I'm not sure that you will grow to manhood uh, very effectively, right? So you've got to have some nourishment. You've got to have some exercise, you know, in physical children, and we all kind of get that, right? What about in spiritual children? Yeah. Take a look at verses 17 through 24 of that same section in Ephesians that we look at, you know. He says, don't walk like the rest of what Gentiles walk. You know, and, and they, have, they have these problems. But then in verse 21, he says, if you've heard him and have been taught by, them, by him, putting off certain things, right, and being renewed and put on the new man, right? These are all things that we are to do after being instructed by Christ. Spiritually, we grow the same way. We have nourishment through the word, and we have exercise through our action. So we train our mind and our body so that we grow. You know, we talk about this in Bible class at least once a year, so let me get, my, get, get this one out once, right? There's a difference between being a Christian for 50 years and being a Christian one year 50 times, right? There's a very big difference between those two things, right? If you're not any more advanced than you were the first year you became a child of God 50 years later, that's a problem. Right? You have work to do in whatever time the Lord has left for you. So we can't, we can't just stay stable. You know, we would be concerned if a child didn't grow. In fact, Dr. Clifford probably seen a thousand of those cases or more where, you know, little so-and-so just not getting, as, getting very big, is there something wrong? Right? So we would be concerned physically for a child that's not developing. Well, spiritually, you know, we should personally be examining ourselves to see are we getting, are we, are we growing, are we developing? But that's also something that we know that the elders are looking at. They're always looking at what classes can we provide? What opportunities can we provide to help the congregation? You know, 
to help and to help individual Christians. You know, what can we do to spur that person to maturity? What opportunities can we present them with? So all of those things kind of fit together in this notion that mind thinking and doing kind of connect together. I want to take one quick second here and talk about the, the term child. Because there's two ways, and there's probably more than that, but there's at least two ways in the scripture that we talk about being a child. One is in a good way, right? Jesus said in Mark chapter 10 and verse 15, whoever doesn't receive the kingdom of God is a little child, right? We are to receive the kingdom just like little kids are. And that's the good sense, right? We are to be open and trusting like little children. But then we're talking about, you know, the reference that Paul makes here in, in Ephesians, where he says, you know, let's not be children anymore. You know, let's not be tossed about every time somebody brings up a new thought about, you know, some point of doctrine. You know, let's not be jumping on that bandwagon and then jumping on some other bandwagon because we haven't spent enough time growing and developing our, our spiritual skills to discern whether or not what they're, what, what's being taught there is true or not. We should no longer be children in that way. I have a friend who used to be in the Marine Corps and he used to do a lot of traveling. And he, tells, he told me once he was sitting next to a mom and her son and a little boy. And he asked, how do planes fly? And he said, the mom did a very competent job talking about airflow. The air goes over the wing, the air goes under the wing, and when it gets enough under the wing, it lifts the plane up in the air, and off it goes. And my friend is kind of a, a prankster, so he kind of looked over at them both, and he said, well, that's one theory. And then he proceeded to tell this little boy about the way we fly is it's the spirit of birds that feel bad for people who can't fly. And so they come along and they lift the airplane up and they carry it to where it wants to go and they put it down, right? And by that time the flight was over, he said goodbye and walked off, right? <laughs> now, we know that's kind of silly, right? But the little boy was captivated by the idea. so. We, gotta be, we can't be like the little boy. We can't be, oh, this is a great new theory. I'm going to grab hold of that. We need to understand what the truth is so that we can enjoy a good story but not be taken away by it. Okay, so one of the things that Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is when I was a child, I spoke as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. And that's what we're talking about here, is developing ourselves so that we are able to do the right things. So how do we measure maturity? How do we check ourselves to see, are we growing? Are we getting closer to our objective? Andy. Okay, absolutely. The first thing is, you know, me not to compare myself to Andy, right? First of all, I would be way underneath and I'd have a lot of work to do just to get there, but he's not the right guy to compare myself to. And, and you know, the only person I should be comparing myself to is Christ. He is the model. So if my actions don't line up, if my thinking doesn't line up with Christ, I know I have some work to do, right? And, and that's a good measure, right? We know that the closer we get to our standard, the more mature we are, you know? We have to measure ourselves against the standard and we have the perfect standard, which is the mind of Christ, right? Paul talks about that in Philippians 4, 9, right? And, and, or in, I'm sorry, in Ephesians 2 and, and, and blah, stop, back up. Philippians 2, and Ephesians 4. You know, in both of those places, Paul is talking about measuring ourselves by Christ. If you look in Philippians chapter 2 and verses 1 through 8, 
He says, therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship in the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being one accord, one mind, let nothing be done through selfish ambitions or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for his own interest, but for the interest of others. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God, did not think it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and becoming in the likeness of men, and being a found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even to the death of the cross. Paul says that's the mindset. We need to get ourselves set mentally so that we are comparing ourselves to the mind of Christ. Then if you look over in chapter 4, verse 9, Paul says something similar. He says, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So we are to observe, learn, and then do. It's not enough to just look at Paul's life and say, yeah, that's good for Paul, but I'm going to keep doing this, right? So, so Paul is always pointing, not only, you know, in that case he's pointing to himself, but he also says, imitate me as I imitate Christ, right? So he's keeping the context always focused on Jesus, you know. And I think that's also true, you know, in the reference that we had in James chapter 2. When we talked about, you know, in James 2, faith without works is dead and, and all this stuff. That's really about kind of putting those things together so that our whole life goes that way. Yeah. Absolutely. See, do, and teach is what Dr. Cuffer said. He said, that's the model for our lives, and, and, and he's right. You know, my daughter just started a job, and the first thing that she did was they took her. That's the first thing. You know, just sit back there and, and wrap sandwiches till you've got that down. We're going to teach you how to do it, then you're going to do it. Okay? Eventually, if she's pretty good, true in every job or or it should be if they just kind of threw you in there with the you know with the million pound stamping press and said here stick this metal in there and, and do it however you want to you know you might have no hands when when you're done so you know hopefully you get trained you know and that's really the same thing compare it to Christ we observe our own manner of life and compare it to Christ. And as long as we're making that not something that should discourage us, it shows us that we have a ways to go. And if we understand going in, we're never going to get there. It keeps us That's exactly right. Because what's the first thing that happens, right? You say, well, you hadn't ought to do that. And they say, well, what about you? Right? You're doing this. And that's the kind of thing that we're, we are trying to, to get away from. So in your notes, I made a point that spiritual maturity is not instantaneous and final. And there's a couple of references in there. One is Hebrews 6, 1 that says, let us go on to maturity. You know? And he never says, you're going to get to maturity. He says, let's go, let's go on towards maturity. And then Colossians 1.28, he says, we proclaim in teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone perfect or mature in Christ. Right? So we have things to do to get along there. And, you know, there's never a point in Scripture where it says you're done. 
You know, we're always being exhorted to get more mature, more mature, more mature. You know, so even somebody who, as we talked about earlier, has just been baptized, you know what? They could be more mature a week from now than they were day one. They could be more mature a month, a year, you know, 10 years. Every day they can be more mature as they, as they learn and, and, and kind of put this stuff together. Okay. So just to kind of lay out this concept, is one is that we need to think daily. This is not an exercise that we do once a week in Bible class. This is not something we do from time to time, but we really need to have daily things going on. And the first thing that we're going to talk about here is this notion of thought protection, okay? It's this idea of controlling your mind, right? Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 to bring every thought into subjection to the obedience of Christ, right? That's our, that's our responsibility is to protect our brains. You know, there's two quotes in there from Proverbs. 4.23 says, keep your heart with all diligence, and Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So we need to protect our thoughts. And if we look at Romans chapter 1, we see uh, Paul talking about a group of people who didn't do that. So someone be willing to read Romans chapter 1, verses 28 through 32. Romans 1, 28 through 32. Please. Uh, 32. Go to the end of the chapter. Okay. Thank you for reading that. So what, what did the ungodly not want to do? Yeah, they did not want to retain God in their knowledge. You know, and because of that, God said, okay, go do what you want to do. But then notice this, as you get down into verses 31 and 32, it says they know the judgment of God. But they don't, not only do they do these things, but they approve other people to do it too. So this is a case of, of kind of head knowledge versus heart knowledge, right? I don't want to retain God in my thought, but, but I know the facts, or I know the information. I'm just not going to apply it. I am not interested in following after God. And as you kind of look through that list, what are the things, the thought sins, if you want to put it that way, that Paul kind of lists in here? What kind of things are, are kind of sins of thought uh, that kind of come into what Paul's talking about in this list? They all manifest themselves in actions, but, but, you know, what are some of the things that people just, you know, kind of grab a hold of and say, you know, it kind of starts up here and then kind of goes from there? Envy, envy. absolutely, right? I could be sinning with envy without ever having acted on it, right? Giving myself over to what a, what a cool car Andy has, right? Right? So, you know, I could be, I could be that. What else? Right, sexual immorality, right? I can, you know, before I ever do things, I can still be engaged in, in, in thought sin, if you will, if you want to think about it that way. Um, here's a couple of them. Think about how these things fit. Covetousness, right? Envy. Wrath. Maliciousness. Evil-mindedness. There's, a, there's one that you know, makes it sound like that's just all-consuming, right? Everything in your brain is kind of caught up in this. And so, but, but again, kind of to the point that we've been, we've been hammering away here, 
most of the sins that Paul talks about have a physical manifestation, right? Even evil-mindedness. What, how would I physically manifest being evil-minded? Yeah, I mean, there's a thousand ways, right? I could just be generally grumpy, right? Generally hard to get along with, argumentative, you know, never a good thing to say, bringing people down, right? I mean, there's a, there's a thousand ways that something like evil-mindedness could manifest itself in my life. And that's the point, is that you, you can only hide this stuff for so long. And because these people didn't want to pay attention to the direction from God, keep that in their heart, and kind of establish a right and wrong standard, they went off into all sorts of things. Okay? Yes, sir? That's absolutely true, right? How many times, you know, people just kind of sitting around doing nothing, and the next thing you know, they're they're, they're, they're salting up an old grudge or, you know, something just pops in their head and they start going that way, right? We got to keep our, we got to bring thought control in, into, into the equation where we're not going to allow that um, to be in there. And again, that's learned behavior, right? Day one for a new Christian out of the world, that's a very big new thought, right? That's a very, you know, you show them 2 Corinthians 10, and they say, every thought, that's, that's mind-blowing. Rufus? I think that's true, and I, and I, and I think you kind of, you know, you kind of have to pair thought control or thought protection with thought shaping, right? So, you know, it, it's, it's like you said, you know, an idle mind is the devil's playground, right? Well, you know, it's not enough, and, and Jesus even talks about this, right? You cast a demon out of somebody, and, and he goes about, and he comes back, and he finds the empty spot, and he says, well, let me go get my friends and come on in and live with this guy. Right, so, so he ends up worse off. It's not enough to just say, I'm not going to think about that. I'm not going to think about that. It's what am I going to think about? How am I going to shape my thoughts so that I can crowd out, you know, things that I ought not to be thinking about? So in, in Romans 8, verses 5 and 6, it talks about setting your mind on things of the Spirit, and it gives this kind of comparison. In fact, let's look at Romans 8, 5 and 6 real quick. Verse 5 says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And over in Philippians, we have this, la this kind of laundry list of things to think about. Um, and the discussion, you know, that we always go through is whatsoever things are true, whatsoever, you know, we kind of run through that. But I thought of just as a, as a quick exercise, let's look at what those things are and, and throw out some examples, right? What is, it, what is an example of thinking of things that are true, that conform to reality? Yes, sir? Yeah. That's a truth, right? Nothing wrong with, you know, that's an example of whatsoever things are true. Well, God created the world, right? What about things that are noble, honorable, good, revered? What can we think about there? Harder than it sounds, doesn't it, isn't it? How about just looking at good works, looking at good things that people are doing for other people, right? In history class, Sarah and I are studying 
post-Reconstruction, right, this whole Gilded Age thing, and there was a lady named Jane Adams who started settlement houses. Basically, she was helping immigrants, and she did real simple stuff. She did things like rock their baby when they couldn't get the baby to stop crying, and she did things like watch the kids while mom went to work, things like that. You know what? Those are good works. Those are noble things that we can be thinking about instead of thinking about some of the trash that we're presented with on the daily news, right? We can look at good works. What about just, things that are right or righteous? What about how we treat others, right? We see somebody or we read of somebody who's taken a meal over to somebody or you know, somebody starts a, a GoFundMe account for Donna Beasley because she's had 15, 16, however many surgeries that poor woman has had, you know, and, and you know, somebody starts up a way to help defray some of those expenses. You know, those are righteous things. Those are right living sorts of things. What about just, or I'm sorry, what about pure? What things are pure, not contaminated? I beg your pardon? Holy or sacred. Holy or sacred. So, so, you know, thinking the best, right? Fighting the impulse to be negative. Thinking about Jesus, right? Well, who was purer than Jesus? I mean, nobody, right? Thinking about God and his holiness. Okay, what about lovely? What sort, what sort of things are lovely, agreeable? You know? I'm sorry? Any example, of Any example of brotherly love. In fact, I think in my notes I said it's like phileo, right? That brotherly love that we have. Any example of that? Somebody helping out somebody else, right? What about a good report? Admirable, gracious, fine. I mean, just any kind of good news, right? So I think you get the idea is that, if, you know, when we break some of these things down, sometimes we get stuck, right? We're like, well, I don't know, what is just? What should I think about when it says to think about things that are just, right? So I threw a few things up there. Um, virtue, excellent good things in others, moral excellent. Admiration for good people, right? Those are things you could think about. Praiseworthy, anything that you see that's good. Anything that is, wow, that was a great thing that, you know, this person did. I mean, those are all, you know, and they don't always necessarily even have to involve someone's interaction with someone else, right? It could be somebody cleaned up the park, right? That was a good work. That was something that really needed to be done and somebody took, we gotta find those things. That's what we need to be filling our minds with is these things and we need to try to find a spiritual application to it because I don't think Paul is really saying, think about people cleaning up the park. You know, I think he's thinking, think about spiritually fine things things that move us forward in our thought life so that we are more effective. Questions or thoughts about that? Try it sometime. Take this list and see if you can think of something from every one of these things and be amazed at how long, how much time you end, spending, spend, end up spending on, on those thoughts and, and how your, your attitude is at the end. I bet you it's better, okay? So we gotta think, but we also gotta do. And, and again, do daily. So in Philippians 4, 9, right after this list, you know, and we've quoted it before, right? Paul, said, or Paul says, the things which you have learned, received, heard, and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you, right? That's being purposeful, right? That is setting up, I am going to do these things. You know, I have, I have a list of these things that I know I need to do. I am going to do them. I'm not going to let it accidentally kind of come up on me. You know, imitate the things that you see in, in people that you have admiration for. Secondly, let's be wise about that, right? And my point about that, and we've seen a couple of examples of this, but even over in Matthew 25, right, the unprofitable servant knew that his master was coming. 
but didn't do anything with the knowledge. <laughs> Wasn't ready. Didn't get prepared. Right? Didn't act on the knowledge that he had. So we need to be wise about how timely our action is. And then finally, let's talk about the power of habit. Okay? And, and habits can be a good thing or a bad thing, right? A habit can, can kind of take the meaning out of something that you're doing if you just let it become, this is what we do. And, and the example that we use a lot is, is taking the Lord's Supper, right? We take the Lord's Supper every Sunday, right? Is it just automatic for you? Or are you just kind of taking the elements and just, okay, this is what we do for the next 10 minutes in the worship service, or are you thinking? Are you being purposeful, and are you being uh, wise in how you take that action? That's kind of the downside of habit. On the other hand, habit can be a powerful thing. Um, the habit of attending worship services. You know, when you are in the habit of, gum, of coming Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, you feel a gap when you don't attend. You know, when I first got out of college and moved up to Michigan, I started going Sunday mornings, and I wasn't going Sunday nights. And it kind of, it started to bug me, because I was in a habit, or I was out of a habit that I had been in. You know, it felt awkward to not be attending Sunday evening. And that's a good, that's a good thing. That is, that is a habit that is connected to conscience, right? So sometimes even when you're not feeling like going to worship, you know, maybe you're in a bad place spiritually in your mind, right? Habit can be the thing that gets you here. And habit can be the thing that because you're here, you are uplifted. Something is said to you or something is taught or we sing a song or something happens at that worship that improves your situation, you know? So don't discount habit as always being a bad thing. Sometimes it can be a good thing. Thoughts about that? Andy. Absolutely. You know, it, it, it is a mind-body connection, right? It is, it is one of the things that we can use to be more effective. Now, yes, sir. That's true. That's true. The more, yeah, Dennis said the more you do these things, the more you stay on track with these things. And, and you don't, you don't, your mind doesn't wander. You stay on the track that you, you conditioned yourself to be, to be in. That accurate. So I'm not going to pretend that I came up with all this stuff. You know, a lot of the things that we're going to talk about in this quarter are from a book from, from Wendell Winkler called Towards Spiritual Maturity. Um, and I borrowed one thing in particular from him that I loved so much that I wanted to have it on here is this idea of four things that we should do every day, right? Four things we should do every day. And so we got five minutes, so I'm just going to run through them real quick. You know, he says, every day we should speak to God. You know, 1 Thessalonians 5.17, right? Pray without ceasing. We should speak to God every day. He says, number two, let God speak to you. You know, Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 said, God in various times talked to people in various ways, but now speaks to us through his Son. Right? Let God speak to you. There's our daily Bible reading. If you do nothing else with your Bible every day, do the daily Bible reading. But let God speak to you every day. Do something for God. Don't kid yourself that some little thing that you do isn't important. Jesus said, even a cup of water that you give in his name counts. And then lastly, let God do something for you. And this is, I hope, oh, he's froze. But you, you froze me. Accept the blessings of God. James says that every good and perfect gift comes from above. Let's thank God for the blessings that he gives us every day.
Thank you guys for your time. Next week, we will move into milk versus meat. <laughs>